Thank you so much for watching or listening to this message from the City Church, a ministry in Springfield, Massachusetts, that's seeking to reveal Christ, reconcile people, and renew our city. Please visit thecitywithin.org for any additional media, resources, information, or if you want to give online. We now take you to part 11 of our sermon series entitled, God With Us. In this message, Pastor Anthony Wirth will be discussing Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16, and how Jesus is our head. Welcome to the City Church. My name is Anthony, and I have the honor and privilege of being one of the pastors here at the church, uh, as well as the honor and privilege during this moment in time of opening up the scriptures and thinking about our great God and who he is and what he's done along with you. Always one of the highlights of of my week, and I hope it is for you too. Um, Let me also just start by welcoming you, especially if this is your first time. Really glad that you're here. Would love to be able to meet you if I haven't uh, been able to already. Um, But should also let you know, though, if this is your first time, or even if you haven't been here for the last several weeks, they're stepping into part 11 of a sermon series. And so uh, I give this spiel every single week in case you're new to church or new to our church as to like what actually happens during this time when we get together. And so here at our church, we take some time in the middle of our gatherings as part of our worship, um, actually as an act of worship, to open up the scriptures and to study them. And uh, we do this by way of taking a theme or a topic or even one of the books of the Bible and looking at it for several weeks in a row. And so uh, as I mentioned, we're in part 11 of this series and this series that we've titled God with us. And all we're thinking about, right, all we're considering, quite simply stated really, is the person and the work of Jesus Christ, which is who he is, his characteristics, qualities, attributes, right? And then also his work, what he does, what he has done, is doing, um, and will do. And there's a couple reasons why we're, why we're looking at, at this, this simple concept of the person and work of Christ. One kind of big picture reason, which is it seems that according to Jesus, there's no more important question that you or I can ask um, in this life than who he is. And so we, we want to say, let's challenge ourselves with that. Let's think through it. Let's digest all of the realities of who he is. Um, and then also, on a personal level, uh, for you, for me, and even, even as a community of followers of Jesus, um, it seems that, that the, the most important thing that anybody could give their lives to uh, is putting Jesus on display to the world around, whether it's to your spouse or your kids and family beyond that, or even at the place of employment or or school, wherever. That seems to be the most important thing or the calling of the Christian life, right? And so then how does that happen? And the scriptures teach that the way that we put him on display is actually by being transformed more into his image and likeness, and that that happens by the renewal of our mind which comes by staring at him, just beholding his glory and who he is and what he does. And so that's what we're doing. We're staring into the person and the work of Jesus to be transformed so that we can put him on display. And we're doing this in kind of, a, kind of a different way, right? Where we're looking at different titles ascribed to Jesus, titles that he gives to himself um, and even titles that other people give to him. And uh, so we've looked at a bunch so far. As I mentioned, we're in, we're in week 11. All of this content's on, on our website too, in case you didn't know, video and, and audio if you're interested in going back. Um, but a, a few weeks ago, we started this sort of subcategory category of names uh, that that are specific to um, more of his work, and even not just his work, but more specifically, his church. And there's there's certain titles given to Jesus that speak to what it means to be his his people, to be his church. And so we looked at him as our cornerstone and us being living stones attached to this cornerstone, him being our, our beginning, our basis, right? Last week, we looked at him as our peace, that he brings people together who are radically different on purpose for the sake of putting heaven on display, right? Um, and this week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Jesus as our head, as our head, and therefore us as his body. And so we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there and, and bookmark it. Um, it would be Ephesians 4, 1 through, through 16. If you don't have one, there's some uh, scattered around closer to the center. You can use one of those. If you don't own one, definitely keep it. It's our gift to you. It'll be on the screen above me as well. But uh, it seems awfully fitting um, in the house of God to go to him that, that he might actually do what we were just talking about, right? So let's pray. God, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing privilege to come together, to have time to come together, to have something to sing about, to have a book to learn from. God, we're grateful that you haven't left us to ourselves to try to figure out who you are, to try to figure out what you're like, to try to figure out what this 
what this life is all about and how to live it, but you've actually you've given to us tons of information about you and about why that matters. And I thank you that you've, you've provoked us and encouraged us and given us the strength this morning to come to a place where, where we could do that, where we can sing and, and be reminded and have our souls stirred by this truth and, and that you've given to us this time to open up these scriptures and to think about this. And, and I ask God that you would help us to, uh, to not take it for granted this morning but that we would, we would take in the reality that this is a time given by you for us, for our benefit, for your glory. And, and even as it pertains to us as a church, God, I pray that you would make us into a people that, that are so unified that it just astonishes the world around. Because only you can do that. And so, Father, would you please use this time for your glory, for our joy. We ask in the matchless and precious name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. I think I heard like two of God's people say amen. amen. There we go. Good. Okay, we're awake this morning. We're awake. Here we go, <laughs> right? So I was, uh, I was born and raised just north of, of San Diego City um, in San Diego County um, with an older brother and a younger sister, my older brother being about two years older than me, my sister being about a year younger than me, and uh, by relatively young parents. So my, my mom and dad were married at the ages of 16, um, respectively, and 18. So my, my mom's 16, my dad, my dad 18. And they had my brother shortly thereafter. So my mom was only 16 when she had my brother, who's two years older than me. So she was 18 when she had me, and uh, my dad was about 20. And then they had my sister one year later. So they, we were really, really young family, right, with really young parents. And because of this, because of the nature of them being so young and just circumstances revolving around their relationship, um, we didn't have the opportunity to become very close with extended family. There was just a lot of division and, and difficulty in, in, in revolving around this, which meant that we were, we were really tight. Uh, me, and, me and my parents and my brother and sister were a really tight family. And with that sort of tightness, you know, where you spend so much time with each other, it comes... Um, comes formation and, and impact uh, upon you that, that stems from who they are, right? And so you've probably experienced this where when you're really close with somebody or multiple people for, for a significant amount of time, uh, they tend to form you. Their thoughts, their opinions, their actions actually make you into a person, kind of, right? And so I, I noticed this especially now looking back uh, when I was 18 and I moved out. Um, I decided that I, I wanted to, to vote, right? And so I, I, signed, I registered to vote, and I got one of those pamphlets that, that tell you all of the, you know, here's, here's what you're voting for, here's who you're voting for, here's what yes means, here's what no means. And, and so I filled it out, and then I decided, well, I'm going to call my dad, and I'm going to ask him how he's voting, right? Because these are the sort of conversations we had when, when I was a teenager. Um, and so I call him up, and sure enough, every single thing we voted the same. And I thought, I am my dad, like, like, this is weird. And it's not so much the same anymore, obviously, because other opinions and, and life experiences has, has formed me since then. But you know what I'm talking about. When you're around people that close to you for that amount of time, there's this, there's this ability that they have to form you and to shape you and to make you into a person, right? And I want, I want to submit to you that, that it's not just in our, in our families as we know them biologically, but even more so, the church family, it's actually part of what it's meant to do. Part of what the church is meant to do is to help form us and shape us into the people that God wants us to be. Have you ever thought it strange that, that the creator of the universe, right, can speak and bring things into existence that we couldn't even imagine and we still don't know the details of? He could also part the clouds, speak directly to your mind and to your soul and change you and make you just like Jesus in a heartbeat. And he doesn't. That's kind of irritating, right? Like, I just want to be like Jesus. Just change me right now, like in, a, in an instant. But he doesn't do that. Rather, he's chosen to actually include us into a family. And that's the means that he wants to use to mold us and shape us. Which means, right, that we should learn about what that looks like and why that matters and, and how this, this process actually takes place. And so I want to think through that with you this morning um, as we see Jesus as our head. Um, this is a title given to him by Paul the Apostle in the book of Ephesians. So I want to take you to Ephesians chapter 4. 
Um, I want to read through the, the first 16 verses with you. It's probably a familiar passage for some of you. I'm sure you've probably heard it before or heard it quoted before. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in here, really cool stuff, and we're just going to get kind of like a flyover view of it all, um, and then I'll give you a little bit of an outline as to where it is that we're going. So here we go, Ephesians 4, starting in verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? That he also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. So I want to think with you this morning about Jesus as our head, um, really kind of under two, two simple headings, right? Um, the first being what it means. So what does it mean when Paul calls Jesus the head here, and especially in this context of this story that he's been kind of telling? And then also, why does it matter? Right? Why does it matter that you and I really think through uh, who, what it means that Jesus is our head and, and actually try to figure out how we live in light of him being our head too, right? So what does it mean? Why does it matter? Let's start with what does it mean, right? And so what does Paul mean when he says that Jesus Christ is our head? What does he mean by that? Well, this is taking place in the context of him actually giving a command, right? So in the beginning of chapter four, as you notice when I was reading, he says, I therefore urge you, compel you, I beg of you, I plead of you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. In other words, he's saying that to walk in this manner as a body, you have this new head. But what is this calling? How do we walk in accord with this calling without knowing what the calling is? And the calling is actually something that he'd been speaking about up until this point in the letter to the Ephesians, right? And so Paul actually starts by telling us this calling of us and God and then this calling of us with each other and then says to walk, right? So let me summarize for, for just a second. When you go back to chapter one, here's what he says. He says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us, or calling us, the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. He's saying, here's the first part of your calling. The first part of your calling is that God actually reached into your life, into your mind, into your heart, and he actually gave you belief in him and called you to himself. And so that's the first part of your calling, that you are actually a son or a daughter in Christ, that your sins have been forgiven, you've been, been given the hope of eternal life. That's the first part of your calling. So he says, walk in light of that. But he moves on from there in chapter one, and in chapter two, he begins to talk about not just how we are sons and daughters, but how we're also brothers and sisters. So the first part of your calling is that you're a son or a daughter, individual relationship with God, but then he moves on and talks about corporate calling. And so here's what he says in chapter two. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. 
So he's saying, right, from the beginning, he's saying, you've been called into relationship with God Almighty through the forgiveness of sin by the shed blood of Christ. You've been given the hope of eternal life. That's your calling. But that's not all of your calling. Your calling is also to be with other brothers and sisters in Christ and to be formed together so closely that you actually create a temple for God to dwell in. This is your calling. If you're a, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's your calling. And so then he says, and so therefore, based on all of that, in light of all of that, walk and walk in according to the calling to which you have been called, that you are a son, a daughter, and your brother or sister. Walk in light of that, right? And in order to walk in light of that, he then tells us that we have to have this head. We have to have this new head, namely Jesus Christ. And so when we're talking about what it means that Jesus is the head, we could say two simple things. First, first of all, we have a new head, right? And we'll talk about that. And then also kind of implicit or implied in that is that we have a new body, right? And that, that'll give us, I think, a better understanding of how to walk in accord with this. So let's think, first of all, about how we have a new head, we have a new head. If Jesus Christ, if, if he really is your savior, you have a new head. What does that mean, right? I think we could, we could kind of open this up just by thinking literally for a moment about heads. And I'm just going to give you a heads up. This is, I didn't mean to do that. I really didn't. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you a heads up. This is really elementary, okay? And, and I don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence here when we talk about these things about heads, okay? But just follow me for a second because it's really important. So two things about heads. First of all, heads are absolutely necessary. Good thing you didn't pay to get in here, right, to learn this. Secondly, heads are sensory by nature. Let's think about these for just a second, okay? Heads are absolutely necessary. Now, this is so, it's so obvious, and again, I don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence, but let's grab hold of this idea for just a second, right? There's something interesting about, about the technology that we've developed, especially pertaining to medicine and, and bodies, right? And so if you lose, like, a limb, we can replace it, right? When you lose your head... Not so much, right? You can't, you can't just go to the hospital and look at the shelf of different heads and pick a new one. You can't do that. So head, heads aren't just stapled on. In order for a body to function and to move and to do anything, or as Paul would say here, to walk, there has to be a head. It's absolutely necessary. So they're not just stapled on. They're not just picked and chosen. Like, they're absolutely necessary. Again, totally obvious, right? But grab hold of that. Absolutely necessary, right? But secondly... And, and I think what Paul is really getting at is that they are by nature sensory. Heads are by nature sensory. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, I actually didn't notice this, even though I, I knew it. I just didn't realize it until this last week as I was thinking through this, that we have five senses, right? We have tasting, smelling, hearing, seeing, touching. It's all five, right? Okay, if we have five senses, four of them are exclusive to your head. You ever thought about that? Out of all five, four of them are exclusive to your head. You can't do those four with any other part of your body. You have to have a head for those senses. And we could even say that the fifth one, of course, you can still do with your, your head, but four of them are exclusive to the head, right? Now, think about senses for just a second, because I think this is what, what Paul's getting at with the new head and how it is that we're able to walk. So the, the purpose of senses, right, uh, of, our, of our nervous system is to take in information for us to actually be able to make decisions and act properly in certain environments, right? So we go out in the world, and we're constantly taking in information through these different senses, through our smell, through our sight, through our hearing. We're taking in all these different, these, these different, all this information, we're sorting through it, and then we're making decisions based on that information that we're receiving, right? And so you smell something, and you decide you want to taste it or not taste it. You taste something, you've tasted it in the past, you decide you're going to or not. You follow me so far, right? Really obvious. So we can't, we can't actually live without these senses, at least not live in a proper manner. So if your senses are distorted or messed up, you're not going to be able to make the sorts of decisions that would be best for you, whether they're things about safety or even things that are just beneficial. You might end up eating something that you don't like because your smell is off, so forth, right? So senses are necessary for us to, to live the way that we should be living, right? Now, what it seems like Paul is getting at here is that with Jesus as our head, we're getting new senses, we're getting new senses to actually be able to live life in the way that he was intending us to because now we have the ability to take in information more properly and more fully, right? And so look at, look at what he says. I'll, I'll remind you of these verses. He says, there is one body, right? Now look at these things. There's one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now, when, 
When I read this, he talks about there's a body. He moves on and he talks about how there's a head. But in the midst of this, he starts talking, he starts describing sort of what this head is. As Christ, we have this one spirit, we have this one Lord, we have this one Father who is over all and in all and through all. And then he talks about this one faith, this one hope, and this one baptism. When, when we are adopted into the family of God, me as an individual, you as an individual, are given a new head, and us as a body of people are given a new head, and that new head comes with new senses, new senses that actually allow us to walk in accord with the calling to which we have been called, that otherwise we wouldn't have been able to walk that way because our senses are distorted or they weren't full or complete enough, right? And so what are those senses? And I would say there's kind of two categories. If we were to take all of those and list them into two categories, there's the sense of the triune God and the sense of ultimate purpose, right? So, so what do I mean by this, right? When we are adopted into the family of God and we're a part of this body, this new head gives to us because of the one spirit and the one Lord and the one Father who is over all and in all and through all, we are given a, a sense of the triune God. Now, what does that mean? Well, just as you live life and you take in information through these senses that help you then make decisions, so now you've been given this new sense of God, God Almighty, who he is, this triune being, and you live life taking information in through that grid, understanding the world in a different way so that you can walk in accord with the calling to which you've been called. So let me just describe this for a second, right? If, if, uh, if I'm just living life on, on, a, on you know, a daily basis, regular, regular life, and, and I go home today, and, and I see my wife, I see Nichelle, I can look at her without the sense of the triune God, and I can look at her just as another human being. There's a female in front of me, whatever, we're married, however the world might look at it. Or... Right? Now, given the head of Christ and the sense of the triune being, I can look at her in light of who he is. And who God is, is a triune being who's been dwelling in all of eternity, who is the creator of all things, the lover of my soul, the one who has actually created me and given to me this woman that we might actually put God on display. So now I look at her, and I don't just see an average woman, I see the woman that God has given to me and is meant for me and her to reflect him. So there's this new sense that, that I have when I see her and when I think of her and when I interact with her. It changes everything. It changes the way that I walk, right? It changes the way that I act because of this new information. But it's not even just with your, with your wife or with your husband. It's with your kids. The way you think about your kids, the way you interact with your kids, all of it changes when you have this new sense of the triune God and of who he is and of what he, what he actually wants and his being and his love and his grace and all of that. And even the way that you work. When you go to work and you face stressful situations or you face situations of temptation, you, you filter that information now through not just your own sight and ears and smells, but through who God is. Who is he really? He's given to us this new sense to be able to walk in accord with the calling to which we've been called. But not just the sense of the triune God does he give us. He also says there's this one hope and there's this one faith and there's this one baptism. There's this other sense of ultimate purpose. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it's almost the same as the, the triune God thing. Everything's filtered through it. So you go, out into, you go out into the world and you live your life, but you live your life in light of, in light of, there is this one faith, and there is this one hope, and there is this one baptism. In other words, right, when, when you start doubting God and his presence, and whether or not he's really real, whether or not there, there really is, right, this, this one who is in control of absolutely everything, working all things together for good, when you begin to doubt all of that, there's one faith. You have a new sense. Everything gets filtered through that. Your doubt gets filtered through that, and it tosses it out real quick. The same way if something bad smelled, you wouldn't eat it, right? You have this new sense. And it, it's, not even, it's not even just that. When, when suffering comes, when difficulty comes, you filter it through, there's this one hope. There is a God who will one day return and make all things new and there will be no more crying and no more tears and no more pain and no more death and it gets filtered through that. And suffering now is altogether different when you have this sense, right? And not even just that, but even the family of God. The way that you live your life amongst other people now totally changes because there is this one baptism. And what he means by that is that we've all been brought into this one family because that's really kind of the entrance metaphor of baptism, being adopted into this family, which means that as you live, you live in light of how this affects 
the family of God. Same way as when you're, when you're a child, when you're a teenager, you, hopefully you think about the way this affects your parents and the way that it affects your siblings. So now it is with us. So when he says, walk in accord with the calling to which you have been called, he's saying, in light of this new head that has given you these new senses, you can now do this. So if we were to summarize, right, Jesus as our head, here's, here's what we would say. Jesus is the most primary, necessary, and integral part of our body. Primary, he's first, necessary, can't do anything without him. Integral affects absolutely everything part of our body. Now, here's the tricky thing, right? When I say this, and, and the way that Paul is speaking of this, isn't just you as an individual or me as an individual. He's, he's not just saying, like, Jesus is your head and Jesus is my head. He's your head and your head and your head. That's true, but he's saying he's your head, which means that we actually have a new body. We don't just have a new head. We have a new body. And so a few things about Bodies, again, not to insult anybody's intelligence, rather elementary, but here you go. Bodies are extremely complex. Bodies are diverse machines, and bodies are generally capable. Right? So let me unpack these for just a second, right? Extremely complex. Now, I'm no studier of anatomy or anything like that, but I do know this, right? Um, I don't know how the things in my body work. <laughs> I don't know how they work. And, and even those who know the most about the things in our body and how they work don't know everything. There's just tons of stuff happening that we just can't even understand. The complexity of different organs and the way they interact with each other is just, it's just mind-boggling. So they're extremely complex, right? But they're also diverse. I mean, if you didn't know any better, if you were, if you were just a child, like, you know, looking at pictures for the first time, and you saw a finger and you saw a lung, like just pictures of them, you would never think that they ever had to work together. You just wouldn't think that because they don't look anything alike and they actually seem to perform radically different functions, but yet in order for them both to work, they have to be united in some way. So there's this diversity about the body too. But then there's also, there's also a general capability of a body. This is where my analogy breaks down a little bit, but follow me here, right? If, if a person is healthy, Right? So take, take the average 20 to 25-year-old healthy male or female, right? They are generally able to do what it is that they need to do. They're generally able to walk. They're generally able to run. They're generally able to talk and to learn, to do all the things that people are supposed to do. They're, they're, they're generally capable of doing those sorts of things, right? And so that said about bodies, clearly a metaphor now for, for the church, which is a metaphor used all throughout the scriptures of us being a body, um, a few things about you and me. First of all, we have a role. Each of us has a role. We have a membership. Each of us needs to be tied in to the others. And we have a goal, a corporate goal, a goal that, that we, we are trying to accomplish together, right? And so let me reflect on, on one of the passages. He says, and we gave, I'm sorry, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, roles, right? For this purpose, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, and now he describes that thing being built up until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. And now he even elaborates on that and he says to mature manhood. That's what I mean. I mean mature man the goal is mature manhood, which looks like unity and it comes from roles. And he says to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Manhood is looking like Jesus. So in other words, it's, it's all about us coming together and us displaying Jesus that makes us mature, right? That's what it's all about. That's the goal. But we all have a role in this. We all have a role. And this is spoken of all throughout the scripture, right? So 1 Corinthians 12, 14, Romans 12, all these lists of gifts that God gives to his people. And he's giving you gifts, not, not for yourself, right? Not, not for myself. He doesn't give us gifts for ourselves, but, but to play a role in a body. And those gifts, they could be all over the place. We're not going to get into like all of the specific gifts. I would commend you reading those chapters that I just mentioned. Um, but every single person has particular gifts, and they're meant to be a part of a body, part of a diverse body, even at that, where these parts are inextricably connected. Now, think about that for just a second, right? Because it's so, sometimes I, th I think we, we think about what it's going to cost us to be a part of the body instead of the amazing benefit of being a part of the body, right? We think of our gifts and we think about exhausting ourselves using those things. We, we tend not to think so much about how absolutely necessary it is for us to grow unless we're a part of the body, right? So even if you're the, you're the fastest foot on the planet, if you're not attached to a body, you don't run. 
right? I mean, it seems so obvious, but it's true. And so we, we think about ourselves, but we, don't, we tend not to think about how critical the rest of the body is for me to actually thrive in my Christianity, right? And to thrive in my walk with him. But that's what he's getting at here, that we all have a role, but we also have a membership. And then we have a goal. This goal is mature manhood, that we would look like Jesus as a body. That's our goal, right? So these things, pretty obvious, right? If, if Jesus is our head, we have a new head, we have a new body. Seems pretty obvious. Let's get extremely practical now and talk about why this matters, right? Why does it matter for, for you and for me, right, to really consider Jesus to be our head, for us as a church to consider Jesus to be our head, and why does it matter, right, that we, ha- that we have a new body? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of swap these, actually, and talk about uh, that, that we need a body, that's why it matters, and that we need a new head, and that's why it matters, right? So first of all, the reason why it matters that Jesus is our head and that we have a new body is because we need a new body. Now, what do I mean, right? Well, Paul, in this passage, he does something really interesting. He talks about how, how we, we have this new head, and, and then he contrasts like this mature manhood of what it looks like when you're actually living the way that you should. He contrasts this mature manhood with being a child, And so he says, all of this, this is what you're growing into, mature manhood, and then he says, no longer like children. He contrasts with this idea of childishness. What's really interesting is as he does this, when he's speaking of mature manhood, he's actually speaking of a single person, and when he speaks of children, he's talking in the plural, many children, which is to say, right, that when, when you're a child, you're isolated, you're not with everybody the way that you should, but when you're united, that's where mature manhood actually is, and he spoke of that before, right? Which means that bodies are absolutely critical, absolutely critical for a person to grow and no longer be a child, right? Absolutely critical. So what do I mean by that? Well, a few things about bodies that are necessary for children, right? The first is this. Bodies provide discernment. Right, so th- this should also seem pretty obvious, but look at what, what, when Paul says, no longer like children, he actually describes a child, right? And he says, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Like children, they lack discernment. They don't have the full senses to be able to sift through what is and what isn't good for them. And they're willing to take in things that aren't good for them because they don't know any different. Their senses aren't developed well enough, Right? So, for instance, if uh, I don't have any toddlers anymore, I have four children, but if I, one of them was still a, child, uh, a toddler, um, and I didn't have a lock on the cabinet underneath my sink, right, where all the goodies are, they, one of them might go up and, and open, open the cabinet, right, and by goodies I meant poisonous things. They might open it up, in case you weren't following, they might open it up and see the blue liquid and go, Kool-Aid, chug, 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 right? And you would all know, that that's Windex, probably, not Kool-Aid. But here they are, just as a child, lacking discernment. They don't even have the ability to really uh, d- differentiate between smells. So they wouldn't even know, really, and here they are just taking in poison. Now, when Paul talks of, of us like children in this way, he's speaking specifically, I think, about us theologically or our understanding of God, that as children, our sense of the triune God and of who he is isn't fully developed, which means that we lack discernment and we can actually take in poison, right? And so if this is the case, and, and I think it's true, um, we have to be very aware as, as Christians, constantly really even, I don't think we ever, uh, I mean, I think there's an element of us understanding that we're children uh, for a long time, okay? And so I think it's really important for us as, as Christians to realize that if I want to develop my sense of God and of who he is, and not swallow down poison and wrong teaching about who he is, I need the body of Christ. That's why he's given apostles and prophets and teachers, as he says, to bring about this maturity. I need other people, right? So, for instance, um, right after I became a Christian, I, uh, I was so excited. I, you know, I went to church one Sunday, and I was like, I was so pumped. I was like, man, I, I wish you would preach another sermon so that I could be there all day. And I went home, and I turned on TBN, and I started listening to this guy talk about how you're supposed to be rich. And I was like, that's awesome. And I went and told my brother about this preacher, and he was like, that is not true at all. <laughs> and I was like, what? You know, and but that sounded so good. But as a child, that's what you do. You, you swallow stuff without even realizing it because they're saying the, the name Jesus 
Well, we're actually talking about different stories. We might even be talking about different Jesuses, like Jehovah's Witnesses who knock on your door. And many young Christians fall away into Jehovah's Witnesses and, and, and Mormonism because they don't fully understand, they don't have a sense of the triune God. Now, that said, that has some, that has some real huge implications and, and, and practical application for us because what this means is for us, if you, if you think, and if, if I begin to think, right, that, that I can just learn everything about God on my own, and so I'm just going to stay isolated. I'm going to flip open my Bible every once in a while and point to a verse and just kind of take in whatever it got, God has to say to, to me and not understand the historical context or what's being said or why it's being said and all of those really important things to understand an ancient text. If I think I can just do it on my own, I'm crazy. And we shouldn't give ourselves to that. But the exact opposite, we should, we should find ways to build into our lives opportunities to develop the sense of the triune God so that as we open up the scriptures, no matter where it is that we turn, we are so fully aware of what is taking place that we can really take it in for what it's meant to be and become more healthy. And so everything, and, and I know, like, I'm a pastor, so when I, when I say these things, it just, it just clicks in people's head, he just wants me to go to church more. Yeah, I want you to go to church more, not because I care about the attendance, but because of Paul's reason here. It's your soul. Like, he, he wants you to grow in health. And I know I need it too. I need to be surrounded by other men and women who care deeply about God and who he is to set me straight constantly and be reminded of those truths. But not even, not even just theologically, right, and regarding the scriptures, but even personally, like when he says children tossed to and fro, yeah, he's talking about winds of doctrine, but man, as soon as I read that, I, I think about me being tossed to and fro all the time. And for some reason, over the last month or so, I've been tossed to and fro, like, emotionally. And it's no, no major reason, but anything can just kind of click and make me angry, click and make me impatient, click and make me sad, and it's just like, what is going on here? And I'm so, so thankful that I have men and women in my life that I can text in any given moment. And then not just text me back and say, I'm praying for you, but text me back and say, Jesus is risen, he is ruling and reigning, and there is a future hope. Hold on to that. Because that's what I need. When you're a child being tossed to and fro by whatever it is that's going on around you, you don't just need advice. You need something to hold on to that does not move. And that's what it is. So, Whatever, whatever this looks like for you, if you don't have people in your life right now that you can, you can go to with stuff like this, man, open yourself up to, to people, myself, any of the other leaders in our church or gospel community, go to men's or women's study and just say, yo, I just need people around me to remind me of the truth. Because sometimes I can't stand. It's just shaking underneath me, right? But get, get those people, do it. But the second reason that, that we need a body, right? is this, bodies provide purpose. And here's what I mean by this, right? Children are, are just radically self-centered, right? Yeah, they are. From the moment they're born, they're like screaming at you for something, and then they don't stop until they move out, and even then they, they scream from other places about what they want and what they need. And I, we know this because we all did this, right? We all did this. So they're just radically self-centered. Their whole purpose in life is to get something for themselves, right? That's their, their whole purpose. And as children, that's us too. As children in the faith, that's, that's exactly how it looks, just radical self-centeredness, which disables us from being able to walk in, a, in accord with the calling to which we've been called. So, so for me, right, little illustration, I guess, is when... When I spend too much time with myself, which I spend a lot of time in study, which is a lot of just time with myself, what I tend to think about most in time with myself is me. And so I've, I fill up my head and my heart with all these grandiose things about Anthony, and then I go out into the community with, with you guys, and with anybody really, and there's needs. And they, they might be needs that cost me emotionally, cost me financially, cost me in time. And since I've been filling myself with me, it's very difficult now to give myself to you. Because I'm so full of me, I'm thinking more about receiving than I am about giving. Because I'm so full of myself. And that's, that's just the way that children act. But what's really interesting is Jesus speaks directly into this. Jesus actually says, it's better to give than to receive. Now think about that statement for just a second. Because I think most of us, we, we tend to translate that in sort of like, in a, as far as emotions are concerned. 
right? So it's, it, you're going to feel better. You're going to feel happier if you give than if you receive. But we all know that's not true. That's not true. You feel a lot better when you receive than when you give. Don't even lie about it. It's just not true, right? So that can't be what he's talking about because it's not true. What he's talking about is, is it's actually better for you and for me when we give because we become the people that we were meant to be. We start to live out our purpose and we start to live out our meaning as human beings we're meant to be, which are people who give themselves to the rest of the community, right? And therefore, it is actually better So you start playing out your purpose. Listen, when we're, when we're self-centered, we can't walk in accord with the calling to which we've been called. And that's why, that's why we have to get into the body because it's actually when you get into the body that you notice, right? You notice your own self-centeredness, but you also are made far more aware of other people's needs Right? And other people's, even, even whatever God has calling upon them, you're just made more aware of that. And as you give yourself to that and to them, now you actually begin to fulfill your purpose. Again, a body, parts coming together, and now it's moving. It's walking in accord with its purpose, right? But the third reason that, that bodies are necessary um, is because they provide stability. Now, ch- children are, are also not just radically self-centered, but radically unstable, right? They, they need they need flashing lights in front of them all of the time in order to be sustained in any sort of environment. So you can't take your toddler to go see Pride and Prejudice. They, they can't, their senses aren't developed well enough to take in the information about the characters being built and the plot plan. Like they can't, they can't take that in because they're just not, they're not stable enough to be able to do it. So they need, they need flashing lights, they need animation, they need, you know, wham, how, like they need stuff like that, right? And as children in the faith, we can be this way too, where we, we can be more consumed with, with seeing something amazing happening and wanting something brand new and fresh in order for us to, to be able to survive the next day with God, right? In other words, children, children know nothing of, of, of self-control. Children know, know nothing of a long obedience in the same direction. And what we're actually being called to and what the body provides us with is that. The body provides us with this, with this place of this, of this person, really, where, where we are moving in this direction. And do you notice he says, walk. He doesn't say run here. He says, walk. It seems to me that this, this growing into mature manhood doesn't happen in an instant. And so let me, just, let me just say this, and I don't mean to be mean here. But if, if you're a Christian who's, who's constantly wondering, like, God, what are you going to do next? You seem so distant until you do some miracle. Or, or I don't really want to go to that event or that Bible study unless I get something out of it. Something amazing has to happen. I can't just commit. I, can't, I don't even want to read my Bible every day because it just seems so mundane. And sometimes you don't show up. Listen, those are all immature statements. And maybe what he wants from you is to throw yourself into those things whether you feel like it or not because it's in the walking that you are made mature. It's in the commitment whether you get something exciting out of it or not that you grow. And it's actually what we grow in. We don't don't have to, we don't have to every single month or year experience something absolutely amazing. It would be awesome if God did that. But he doesn't have to. He's calling us to just walk, long obedience in the same direction for mature manhood, right? So this is, this is what he's calling us to, right? Now that said, because those, those three things are kind of mean, and I didn't mean to like pummel you guys down today, but let me say a couple things about our, about our, our church as a community first, because I think it's helpful for us to get some, some communal practical application. And the, the first thing that I would say, and they're, they're not on the screen, the first thing that I would say is don't be shocked by, by messiness and by baby sorts of behavior. We, we want to be a church that grows, which, which means as families grow, there's babies. And babies make messes. Like, that's what they do, right? They poop themselves. And, and what happens when, when that happens? You don't yell at your infant for pooping themselves. You go, well, you're an infant. And so you come alongside and you clean and you help, right? And they don't walk instantly. You have to come alongside and help train and help walk. Let's not be the kind of church that is shocked when people are a mess. Let's not be that because it just, it kills, it actually kills the family. Let's be the kind who step in and help clean and train and help other people come up. Let's be those kinds of people. 
But that said, right, the flip side is stop messing yourself. <laughs> like, if, if, you, if you know better, right, if you know better and, and people have been coming alongside you, at some point you have to admit that, like, I should be past this. And you shouldn't just, you shouldn't just settle with that. You shouldn't settle with childishness. You shouldn't settle with immaturity in your own life. You should do everything you can to take in the, you know, the means that God has given to help you grow and to be trained and to learn from those things and grow, right? And the, I know that those are kind of paradox, but we ha- you know, one's more communal and one's definitely more personal. But don't settle with your childishness. Now that said, right, we, we need a new body. If, if we're going to be mature, which is the goal, we need a new body. But not only that, we need a new head. And this is why this title really matters, because we simply cannot walk in accord with the calling to which we have been called unless we have a new head. There's just no way. In fact, let me remind you, the first couple of verses, he says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now check this out. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager excited to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Now, I don't know about you, but I read that and I go, that sounds exhausting. Give yourself on purpose and be humble and patient at the same time. And I'm like, no, (laughs) I don't want to do that. It sounds exhausting, right? So in order for me to even want to, which he says to want to, be eager to, I need a new head. I, I need a new, a new head through which things are filtered through in order for me to even want to do these sorts of things, let alone to be able to live it out. And that's the beauty of what has happened in Christ. When, when God sent his son, right, to live and to die and rise from the dead, he didn't, he didn't say, and did you see how he lived? Now do it exactly like he did. He does say that. But he gives us even more than that. In other words, Jesus isn't just an example If Jesus were just your example, my gosh, the the weight on our shoulders every day would just kill us. Because if we're just supposed to live like Jesus, man, all of us, we fail tremendously over and over and over again. The beauty of the gospel is that, that he didn't just tell us what to do in Jesus. He gave us the ability to do it. Look at what he's, what Paul says in the book of Philippians. Have this mind among yourselves. Have this head among yourselves. Check this out which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't hold on to his deity, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Listen, this isn't just the example of Jesus although it is, that he's, he's living out exactly what Paul tells us to live out in Ephesians 4. Walk in accord with this, humility, gentleness. Jesus actually did it, but that's not all that he says. He says, and because Jesus did it and he rose from the dead, he has given you a new head. He has given you the mind of Christ. He has given to you these senses of the triune God and of ultimate purpose that you can actually now walk. You can actually do it. Now, what's, what's so amazing, right, is... Paul, in in the book of Ephesians, as he starts with this amazing calling that we have, that we are children of God, and then he moves into how we are brothers and sisters. In chapter three, before he tells us to walk, he does this really amazing thing. He prays. Before he tells us to do anything, he prays for us. And what he prays for us is one of the most beautiful and amazing prayers, and it's really how I want to close this, with Paul's prayer as opposed to, to my own prayer. And so if you wouldn't mind, just close your eyes and take in the reality of of this. For this reason, because God has sent his son and taken away your sin because heaven is real, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, from whom the city church is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant us to be strengthened with, with power through his spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we, being rooted and grounded in love, 
may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.